And they lived happily ever after. The end. Thank you for listening. See you next week. No, don't stay. <laughs> That's sort of how uh, the stories are supposed to end, aren't it? Uh, but life isn't a fairy tale. So let's rewind a little bit and go back earlier in that story where we have a couple facing each other saying, I take you for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, till death do us part. Pretty serious words sworn by millions of couples to each other, to their family, to their friends, and before God. And yet, 41% of those who make that promise the very first time they do it, don't make it. The marriages end in divorce. So, okay, all right, so that was a practice, so now we're going to get married a second time, and second time we know what we're doing, finally, so we make that promise again, and, and the, the odds are... Much better that we'll make it through there, but no, that is not the case. In fact, the case is uh, the odds for a second marriage is 60% divorce. That's right, it went up 60%. So, okay, let's go for the third marriage. You know, we got, the, we got this down now. We, we got to figure we know exactly what we went wrong the first two times. We get married a third time, and now the divorce rate goes up to 73%. What is going on here? So during the month of February, we've been looking at love, marriage, healthy relationships, and learning to do things God's way. Uh, my name is Rory. By the way, everybody say hi, Rory. Hi, Rory. Hi back at you. Hi to you all watching us on the YouTube channel. We are glad that you are part of the Springs family as well. And today we're going to talk about relationships, focusing mostly on husband and wife relationships, but that it works for everybody, what we're about to say here. So if you're married or you're single or you're divorced or, or you're soon to be married, this is for you. And our theme verse for this series it comes from Romans, and it goes like this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So it's important for you to know right off the bat that this isn't just good advice that I've gleaned over my six different marriages, or just kidding, or that I got from some self help book somewhere or uh, from watching TV or movies or even that great wisdom that comes from sitcoms. No. Everything I'm going to teach is based on the Word of God, which is admittedly the best self-help book in the world, although it's not really a self-help book. It's a God-help book, which is even better. Yeah. Today, we focus on conflict, and <laughs> if ever there was an area that we need God's help with, and, and to let God transform us in, this is it. Let's face it, conflict is unavoidable. But it doesn't have to escalate into World War III every time an issue comes up. There are ways to resolve conflict in a relationship, and that's what we're going to talk about today. i I got to be honest with you. This is My wife and I, we have like the best marriage I know. Um, we have a great marriage, but does that mean that we never have conflict? No. Oh, yeah, we go at it sometimes. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. Now, when, when we were younger, that most of our conflict came from the way to raise the kids. We just disagreed in that. Um, she was very, very, very strict. And me, well, let me just put it this way. My wife used to say, you know, it's not easy raising three children. We, we only have the two boys, so... I'm, I'm the third one. <laughs> and let's face it, um, yes, I can be a big kid sometimes. Oh, what a surprise, Pastor Rory. We, we wouldn't have believed that. But um, it's important that, that, that she was way stricter. I was way more tolerant. And looking back on it now, i got to be honest with you, now that our boys have grown up and, and have families of their own, she was right. She was right. But at the time, conflict. Of course, today, the kids have grown up and gone away, so there's no conflict at all in our marriage, <laughs> ever. <laughs> Boy, can you just stand up here and lie like that? Is that, a, is that okay at church? I don't think so. No, it's, of course it's not, it's not true, because there will always be conflict from two people that live in the same house. There are five ways to deal with conflict. My way, your way, halfway, God's way, or the highway. 
You've heard that, my way or the highway. Well, look, let's take that last one right off, right off the table. All right, uh, Brian talked about it, it last week. Uh, divorce should go right off the table. It should never be part of a discussion. And if you are committed to living and staying with somebody, then you got two choices when conflict arises. You'll either solve the conflict or you'll be miserable. So you figure out a way to get past it, through it, over it, and done, and move on. So let's take that one off the table, so let's go back one to God's way. That's the one to go with. Is it easy? No. No. Is it worth it? Absolutely. There is nothing like having a loving partner to go through life with. That's what every love story ever written is all about, isn't it? It's finding the one, that happily ever after person. Is happily ever after a myth? No. Uh, and yes. <laughs> yes and no. I'm at a yes because people think of happily ever after, meaning happily at every single moment in your entire life. Of course, that's impossible. Um, every marriage uh, has problems in it. No marriage is a bed of roses. Unless, of course, you're thinking of roses as, like, they have thorns, and if you don't hand handle them carefully, you're going to get hurt. And marriage is a bed of roses. But is happily ever after impossible? It's not. It's not. You can live happily ever after. It's not a myth. And I'm going to tell you how this morning. It takes work. It takes patience. It takes humility, forgiveness, flexibility, encouragement, expressiveness. It takes faithfulness. It takes strength. And it takes resistance to the world's ways. And all that obviously becomes much, much easier if you partner with God. So today, that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you nine ways, nine tips from God to help your relationship, your marriage, if you're married. So if you're the kind of person that takes notes, take notes. Write down these nine. If you're not the kind of person that takes notes, write down these nine. <laughs> Do it anyway. I'm going to start with number one, which is be patient. Be patient. Patient ties in very closely with tolerance. <laughs> it could also be defined as Putting up with, I can only put up with this situation or this behavior or this person so long before I go medieval on them. We're an impatient lot, we humans. We want what we want, and we want it now. We want an immediate return on our investment. We want to be a star overnight. We want to lose weight fast, but that doesn't work because we also want fast food. We want our deliveries overnight. We drink an instant breakfast. We cook minute rice. Our high-speed internet isn't high-speed enough. It took three seconds to load. And we want our spouses to do what we want them to do, and we want them to do it now. We want them to change in the way we want them to change, and we want them to change now. But that's not going to happen. Change takes time. Right. Habits didn't become habits overnight, and habits do not go away overnight. What wife hasn't ever taken out the trash because she just got tired of waiting for the husband to do it? Or picked up his clothes? What husband hasn't dragged out the vacuum cleaner and vacuumed the rug because he got tired of waiting for the wife to do it? Just checking to see if you guys are paying attention there. <laughs> you got to have patience. Patience shows kindness and understanding and love. Ephesians says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, accepting each other in love. Look, we, before we got married, we all put in like 10, 20, 30 years of forming habits that we had, developing our way of doing things. Now, I'm not saying that we have to acquiesce in the other person's way of doing things, but somewhere along the line, we're going to make a compromise and decide, okay, that's the way we're going to do it. But if... if the way you decide to do it isn't the way that they were doing it. It's not going to happen overnight. You've got to be patient with them. It takes time for habits to be changed. My wife has been very patient with me, waiting for my habits from before we were together to change for 30 years now. She's very patient. All right, the second thing is, after be patient, is be humble. Be humble. Jesus told us, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Not bad. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Well, that doesn't sound so good. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Those others, of course, include your spouse. Now, we're going to set the example uh, that Jesus set, the trait of, uh, this, this trait uh, of serving may be the most important one of all. I mean, uh, Jesus' entire ministry was about serving, his entire life, and his death, by the way. <laughs> so you want to be like Jesus? Serve your wife. Serve your husband. See to their needs. And humility also means trying to, st- to stop trying to one-up each other. Stop keeping score. You did this. Well, you did this. I had to wash the dishes every dinner this week. Oh, really? Well, I did the lunch dishes. Well, you did the lunch dishes because I was at work working hard to earn money to do this. Oh, yeah, I wasn't working hard. I was at home. Look at this house. Who cooked the dinner? Stop that. You're not always going to do equal amounts of work. You're not always going to share the financial responsibility, the workload individually, but that's okay. It's a partnership. Each of you has your own strengths. You contribute in your own way. You can... Your strengths can balance out the other person's weaknesses. That's why marriage works. That's why life is better with that person than it is without that person. Instead of thinking of it as they're not doing their share and so I have to do it, maybe consider thinking about it as they didn't get that done so I have an opportunity to serve them by doing it for them. (laughs) <laughs> That's radical thinking, isn't it? I was like, really, Rory? Yes. Yes, that takes humility. Paul wrote the Ephesians saying, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You, yeah. Be humble, humility. Number three is uh, forgive one another. Because, yeah, your spouse is going to mess up. Yes, they are. They're going to do something they shouldn't have done or that you think they shouldn't have done or say something they shouldn't have said. And you can either hold it against them or you can forgive them and get on with loving them. This isn't easy. C.S. Lewis once said, you know, forgiveness is always a great idea. Everybody says so until they have somebody to forgive. So you're both human. Don't be surprised when you hurt each other. It's going to happen. When I perform a wedding, I always say this. I say to the couple, you aren't promising to always feel for each other as you do today. You are promising to act toward each other like you say you will today. We don't always live up to that, though, do we? And uh, so then you need to be willing to forgive your spouse often. This doesn't mean that you condone their actions or that their behavior didn't hurt you. What it does mean is that you're willing to reconcile. The impact that this is going to have on your marriage is huge, huge. Forgiveness restores and rebuilds and helps you move forward into happiness again. And nobody wants to live in an unhappy household. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And Ephesians again says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as the Lord God forgave you. It comes down to this. You want to be forgiven, don't you? You want to have the grace in there? Well, then you have to forgive others and give them grace. It's a two-way street. All right. Number four is seek to be flexible. Flexible things don't break as easy as inflexible things do. The mighty oak is known to fall when the wind hits it and knocks it over. But the willow tree, which is flexible, bends in the wind. When we were in uh, Venice, Italy, they have wonderful glass things there in Venice. And and I was in a shop and they had a spider. And it's 
it, it's like the size of my hand, but the legs of the, it was made of glass, and the legs were as thin as the legs of a real, like, daddy long legs spider. I mean, it was, like, so delicate and cool looking, and I said to the guy, I would love to take that, but there's no way I'm going to get it back home to the United States without it breaking. And he said, really? No, they're, they're actually pretty flexible. And he held this thing, like, this high above the glass counter and dropped it. And it went... The glass was so thin, it was flexible. It was cool, and I have that at home, because I did get it. But uh, as fragile as it was, it's the flexibility that kept it from being broken. Speaking in allegories here. <laughs> you guys catching that? <laughs> We need to be flexible with our time, our finances, our relationships. Why? Well, because things aren't always going to work out the way we wanted them to. I know of a couple that has a 20-year plan. They had a 20-year plan. And how do you think that worked out for them? <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with having a 20-year plan, but it did not play out the way they were thinking of it. But it's okay to have a 20-year plan. Sure, you, you know, plan ahead, but you've got to be flexible because otherwise you're going to get heartbroken. You're going to be disappointed. Things are not going to be the way you wanted them to be. You're going to be like, oh. So you got to be flexible. It's not easy to be flexible. Dancers are flexible. Gymnasts are flexible. Martial artists are flexible. You know what? In order to get that flexible, they had to stretch. And you know, stretching is painful. Another allegory. <laughs> I'm going I'm to sleep slipping those in. And just make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Look, accidents happen. Illness happens. Nobody anticipates this. We all figure we're going to grow old and grow old together and strong in our relationship and okay and sound of mind and body. It doesn't work that way always. It just doesn't turn out that way. Life throws us a curveball. I, my day job, um, I work for a hospice. And my job is to visit with people that are dying. And that's what I do all day long. I go from person to person and I spend time with them. Uh, and, and these people, many of them have spouses uh, that are watching after them. It's amazing to watch. These couples did not anticipate that this would be the situation, that they would be changing the diapers of their spouse or that they would have to ro roll them over three times in the night so they wouldn't get bed sores or that they wouldn't, their spouse wouldn't even remember who they are when they talk to them. Nobody signs up for that. But it happens. And what's amazing is these people step up, and they are there. It's inspirational. My friend Jim's wife was hit by a car here in Vegas years ago, he broadsided, boom, and she and got a traumatic brain injury, and she ended up basically uh, with the personality um, of a five-year-old. They were, they were not expecting that. He didn't sign up for that, but he did sign up for sickness and in health and better or for worse. And that wasn't so much a curveball that was tossed at him. It was a hand grenade. I mean, everything changes. All his plans changed that day, everything. But because my friend Jim is a man of God, he leaned hard into God, and he tapped into God's strength to get through that. And now 17 years later, they are still married and still going strong. And he's still taking care of her. He is inspiring to me. Deuteronomy says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. If you can lean into God, he'll be there for you. All right, that's uh, number four. Number five is cheer for your spouse. Cheer for your spouse. Be your spouse's greatest cheerleader. Woo! -hoo! Make every day a pep rally. When you rally behind your spouse and encourage him or her, you'll also encourage yourself. You desire to see them succeed and do good. It motivates you to do the same thing. Let them know how much you appreciate them. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. Beautiful words by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. 
How often do you tell your spouse something like that? Valentine's Day, two days ago, I bet you every one of you, uh, or most of you, <laughs> gave your spouse a Valentine's Day card. And inside of that card was a lovely sentiment that some creative writer wrote in it. Says how much you cared for them, how much you love them, how much they inspire you, how much you look forward to coming to them every day. Did you guys give cards like that? I, I gave my wife one. The wonderful woman I love. She makes me want to be a better man. She challenges and motivates me. She makes me happy, and I do anything to make her happy. Hey? I didn't even have to think it up. <laughs> of course, I did write something inside, naturally. Um, I wrote this. How beautiful you are, my darling, and uh, oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields of warriors. It's quite the necklace. <laughs> Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. You are all together beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Heart, 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 heart. Now, my wife read that and she laughed because she knows this is a quote from the Bible. This is right out of Song of Songs. And she laughed at that because it was very funny. But after she laughed, she turned around and she said, and you don't forget that last line. There is no flaw in you. Remember that. <laughs> Good reaction, I thought. Do you, just, do you just do it on Valentine's Day, or do you do, you do it every day? At our house, uh, I don't drink coffee, but my wife does, and there's a coffee pot, and the top of the coffee pot is flat and plastic and white. And so I have uh, some dry erase markers, and every day uh, when I start the coffee for her, when I get up before she does, I, I write a note on the top of the coffee pot. You know, things like, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. One, two, three, four, five. I had numbers everywhere, all over the coffee pot, all down the sides. Or you are special, or you rock, or always and always, or I love you so. Those are the things. I do that all the time. Do you do that for your wife? And not only should you tell her, but you should tell other people, too, how great your spouse is. You should let them know. We, we were sitting in a group one day talking with a group of people, and, and uh, one, one of them said to me, it was a, a, a lady that said to me, she said, you know what's one of the most attractive things about you? And immediately I got a little uncomfortable because it's like a woman saying that to me. And, uh, but she said, one of the most attractive things about you is the way you talk about your wife when she's not here. Men, when you talk about how wonderful and special and talented and beautiful and loving your wife is, it just reminds you that she's really a great thing to go home to. And ladies, when you tell your friends what a terrific, attentive, loving, hardworking, loyal husband you have, it reminds you of how lucky you are and that he is special. Thessalonians says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Your words have power. They can inspire. Which leads us directly into number six, which is love expressively. Love expressively. You can't just feel it. You got to say it. You got to say You know, so they can think, well, you know what? I told you I loved you at the wedding, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, you got to let them know every day. Demonstrate it. Learn your spouse's love language and learn to speak it. Do you guys know the love language thing? If you don't, let me explain it real quick. Uh, we all have ways that we feel love, loved. We feel loved through different 
different methods. All of us. I'll give you there. Uh, some some psychologists and Christian leaders broke this down to five different love languages that fit most of us here, and they are words of affirmation, being told, "Good job, do it a good job. You look beautiful today." Words of affirmation, acts of service. This this one turned out to be my wife's. I didn't know that until we discussed the love languages. Once you learn these love languages, by the way, you should discuss them with your spouse and find out because <laughs> I was reading the book. There's a book called the, the Five Love Languages, reading it, and, and I said to my wife, well, I know what yours is. And she said, no, it wasn't. Mine's act of services. See, mine is, acts of, uh, is words of affirmation. So I naturally put that onto my wife, thinking that that was the ones to use because that's what we do. We use our love language on other people, thinking that that works for them. But that's a mistake because I would say to my wife, you know, you were so beautiful. Your, the dinner you cooked was fantastic. What a great outfit. You look really, really good in that. Um, you did a great job doing this. Words of affirmation. My wife was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to show me you love me? Mow the lawn. <laughs> Go clean the swimming pool out. She's an acts of service person. The next one is receiving gifts. Some, some people, it's receiving gifts. You know, you, then you... You bring them things, you, you give them candy, you give them a teddy bear, you give them some chocolate, you give them some flowers, whatever, flowers, you know, that sort of thing. Jewelry, jewelry works, gentlemen. Even if it's not receiving gifts, jewelry works. <laughs> Quality time is another one. This is, this is a really important thing with just being with somebody. By the way, most kids' quality time is their is their love language. You can just spend time with them. You know, I hear all about, well, my, my dad never was at home and he never said I love you and stuff, but we knew he loved us because he worked all day long, like 12 hours a day to put a roof over our heads. That's nice, but uh, it's not enough in my opinion. Quality time. And the last one is physical touch. And let me tell you, physical touch doesn't necessarily mean sex. Physical touch can be holding hands. Physical touch can be putting your arm around somebody. Physical touch can be giving them a back rub. It's, it's not just a sex thing. So those are your five love languages. And you, if you can learn about those, and you can f talk to your spouse about those and find out what their love language is, then you can connect with them on a way that makes them happy and vice versa. So then they know what your love language is. Make an effort to remind your spouse on a regular basis how much she or he means to you. This, this helps keep marriages together. Marriages together. Let me tell you something. How, many, how much effort did you put in courting your wife? Talking to the gentleman now. Now, I know courting is an old-fashioned kind of a word, but courting is different than dating. Courting has an end game in mind. Courting, you're, you're going for something. You're, you're selling something. You're selling yourself to the other person, and, and uh, eventually... You close the deal, and you sign the bottom line on that marriage license. All right, that's courting. But you put some time into that. That's take time and effort and money to do that. But did you stop once you closed the deal, so to speak? <laughs> because that's not a good thing. But wait, Rory, I can't afford to do that in our entire lives. We'll go broke. Not true. Little, very practical advice, gentlemen. How much actually does it cost to take your wife on a date once a month? Take her out to dinner, 65 bucks maybe. I know because I just took my wife out to dinner and it was $60. But if you can't afford $60 a month, I get that, I understand some people are just really on a budget, so how much does a bouquet of flowers cost? You go to Albertsons to pick up a bouquet of flowers for under 10 bucks. That's, that's not very much money. Or if you don't want to spend that much, how about a teddy bear or a box of chocolates? Or a pint of her favorite ice cream. I like to go down to Baskin Robbins and, and pick up daiquiri ice for my wife because I don't like daiquiri ice, but she loves it, and it's just hers, and it's right there, and it's $5 for a thing like this, and it's ridiculously expensive, but it says something. It says something. If that's too much for you to spend, okay, how about a small card? You know, you can get a card at the dollar store down on the corner there for 50 cents. It's not even a dollar. It's 50 cents. You can get a balloon, a helium balloon, for 99 cents. Which is, we have a, uh, at our house, we have a, a th th thing called the balloon bunny. We call it the balloon bunny. It's a little stuffed rabbit, and it holds our balloons. And we, you come into our house, you'll see there's always a balloon there. 
because the balloon bunny gets lonely without his balloon, so. But the, the balloon, depending on the season, balloon says happy Easter, balloon says Merry Christmas, balloon says happy anniversary, balloon says I love you Valentine's Day. We have, right now the balloon bunny's holding two balloons because I got her a balloon, she got me a balloon. So I got my wife a, a happy anniversary balloon and um, I got it to her in, in May and by August it was still there floating. Isn't that weird? <laughs> the, the, it still remained floating for like three months. What she didn't know and was I switched out that balloon for one exactly like it whenever it started getting one. It was like, one like this balloon is amazing! <laughs> it was a happy anniversary for three months. That doesn't cost much. And if it's still too much, if a dollar is too much to spend, then how much does it cost to put a little I love you note, stick it in the refrigerator where she's going to find it? It's, it's not hard to do these things. Or text. Text her some little hearts, little heart emojis. Or better yet, call her up in the middle of the day and say, I, I was thinking of you. By the way, this isn't just guys to women. Ladies, you can do this back to the guys. We don't mind. That costs nothing. How much does it cost to never leave the house without saying to your spouse, I love you, and giving them a kiss? Never leave the house without saying, I love you, and give them a kiss. So if something should happen to you, God forbid, you get killed in a car accident, the last thing you have said to your spouse is, I love you. I never leave the house without saying that, ever. How much does it cost to mute the TV when you're watching the TV and somebody comes over and your, your spouse says, asks you a question or something, just to hit the mute button and turn and focus on them. Now, oh, if you're in, the, uh, you're in the middle of the big game, you don't want to do that. Well, but you know what? There's this thing called TiVo. It is the greatest relationship invention ever built. For those of us that watch TV, because you can hit the button on TiVo and it freezes it right where it was. Even if you're watching li live TV, you can have the conversation, spend a minute focused on the person or two or however long it takes. You come back and you push the button, it picks up exactly where you left off. I told you this was going to be practical advice. Uh, it's important to spend time and effort on these sort of things. I was at a marriage conference and the pastor came up to me and said, you know, you have to spend uh, time with you. you. You need to have a date night, he said. A date night every week, you need a date night. You go out, go to dinner, Go dancing, see a movie. I said to him, my wife and I have a date night every week. Go out, have dinner, dancing, a movie. I go on Tuesdays, she goes on Thursday. <laughs> that was a joke. All I'm saying is, show your love. The, the Bible does not just, don't just speak of love, but show Love indeed. My children, we should love people not only with words and talk, but with actions and true caring. All right, number seven is be faithful. Be faithful. Now, there's two ways that I mean this. The first one is, is be full of faith. Be faithful. Be full of faith. Faithfulness is important to have in your relationship with God and with yourself. Have faith that God cares about you and he will fulfill his promises in your life. Have faith that he is powerful and he is all you'll ever need, really. Wives, have faith in your husband so he can learn to be the man that God desires him to be. And women have, men have faith in your wives that they can get, grow closer to God and, and therefore grow closer to you. Faith in God will get you through the worst times. I don't know how people do it, honestly, without it. I don't know how people do it. But the second way, I mean, to be faithful is the obvious one when we're talking about marriages. Be faithful. Intimacy should only be shared with your chosen person. Period. Nothing destroys a marriage faster than jealousy. There's a basic rule here. Don't be alone with anybody of the opposite sex other than your spouse. Don't 
call them on the telephone, don't text them, don't be Facebook friends, simple but effective. And 1 John says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Which leads us to the last thing, which is resist life's temptations. Temptations are around us all over the place. They bombard us through television and billboards and movies and music and magazines and the internet and social media. Temptation, temptation, temptation. Corinthians says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, and the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Flee from sexual immorality. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. In other words, he's saying, you want, you want to be a Christian? Then act like a Christian. And I'm not just talking about fleeing from sexual temptation. I'm, I'm talking about fleeing from other temptations, material things or money or power. These things all destroy... A marriage. More marriages have been broken up over money than anything else. Uh, don't fall into that trap. Live within your means. Take a, a course on, on how to handle your money in a biblical good way. Uh, don't try to keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses are drowning in debt. And what about power? Well, obviously you shouldn't revel in your power over your spouse, you know, ordering them around, controlling them. I knew one couple, and whenever they went out, he would walk with his hand like this on her neck. You know, and it looked like he had his arm around her and looked very friendly, but he was controlling her. And if he didn't want her to do something, he'd squeeze. And if she started to say, you know, and he would like, and that marriage did not last. And you can understand why. You do what I tell you to do. That just leads to resentment and very often abuse. So don't do that. But also, if you go to work and you have one of those jobs that is like, you know, a job that where people speak to you in a demeaning way and you are ordered around and you were told do this and do that and you feel like it makes you feel small, don't go home and then try to make up for that by belittling and bossing around your spouse. That kind of power is never good. You never have to put your spouse down to build yourself up. Okay, okay. This is where the worship team can come back up if you're coming back up. And now, finally, we're at number nine, which is unite. Unite. Unite with each other. Unite with God. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Remember, you're on the same team. At our house, we call it Team Johnston, and we are a mighty team to behold. We unite. We are on the same team. We also unite with God. Having God in your life can make your marriage bulletproof. Attend church together, serve together, pray together, pray for each other. Get to know God and go to him first and always let him know how you're feeling. And if you're tired or weak of serving your husband, ask God for strength. If you're having a hard time understanding your wife's perspective, ask God to give you understanding. Or if life is swirling around you both, you feel like, your life is out of control, ask God to calm the storm and to help. Trust in Him. Don't rely on your own strength or your own wisdom to get you through because it's not, it's not enough. Make your marriage a trinity. You and your spouse and God. And that's a triangle. The closer you get to God, the 
the closer you and your spouse come together. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three stands is not quickly broken. And Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. You need to get God to help you because he's your source of strength. In one of his books, British Bible teacher F.B. Meyer talked about how uh, Christ living in us makes all the difference in the world. In a, in a moment of temptation, Meyer said that he, if he felt himself getting anger, uh, angry or, or irritable, he, he would ask the Lord for the quality that he most needed at that moment. Your patience, Lord Jesus. Your kindness, Lord Jesus. Your love, Lord Jesus. Your courage, Lord Jesus. Your wisdom, Lord Jesus. Your joy, Lord Jesus. Your compassion, Lord Jesus. I do this. And I'll tell you something. You turn to Jesus and ask for help in a moment of distress, and it's very, very hard not to get that help. You can't say, your patience, Lord Jesus, and then turn around and snap at somebody or scream at the kids. It, it, it helps in that moment. Or your Lord love Jesus. And then turn around and say something to your spouse. If you say that, your love, Lord Jesus, it's going to change you in, in a moment. I highly recommend this. Highly recommend this. What would happen if we all follow the advice that we talked about here today? What if we approached our marriages with patience and humility and forgiveness and flexibility? What if we were our spouse's biggest cheerleaders? What if we resisted life tem life's temptations and, and were faithful to our wedding vows? What if we li relied on God for our strength and wisdom and instead of trying to do it our way with our limited knowledge? What would happen? How would this change our lives and our marriages? Well, marriages would be stronger. Our family relationships would bring us joy. We would be an inspiration to our children, and they would learn by watching us how to do relationships better, and how to handle conflict in a good way. Every day would be a delight, and every married couple in this room could stay together and grow to old age together and live happily ever after. Yeah, I think we have time. I know there's a lot of couples in this room. I'm going to do something uh, just kind of different today. I'd like all the... I'm going to I'm gonna run you through some what we would call uh, marriage renewal vows. And if you want to participate, stand up. Face your spouse, take their hands, look in their eyes, and repeat after me. Before God and all these people, I renew my commitment to love you. I promise to cherish you as God's gift to me. To respect you and accept our differences. To encourage and support you continually. To grow in loving God with you. To forgive you and be open with my feelings. I love you with all my heart and will for all of my life. With God's help, I'll make our home a place of joy as long as we both shall live. Amen. 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 Hey, if you are um, just getting to know about this Jesus thing, if you haven't uh, quite figured it out, or if you have decided that today is the day that you want to step forward and say, uh, make a commitment to, to have Jesus lead your life, 
We would like to help you do that. And we're going to have a team of people down here uh, that are willing to pray for you as well. If you've got something going on in your life that uh, you would like to pray about or you know somebody else that has something going on in their life that you'd like to pray for them for, come on up. So let's invite the, uh, the prayer team on up here. There they are. <laughs> there we go. All right. That's all right. We, we as you can see from the, the very light group up here, we have a lot of sickness in our congregation today. So you get a moment. Pray for health for everybody. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and, and uh, I'd like to pray this prayer. Father God, thank you so much for being the Father that you are for loving us so much and for sending the example of Jesus down and how to serve. And we know that being in a marriage is a position of servitude. We serve our spouses. We love our spouses. Help every marriage in this room be strong. Help every marriage that isn't for someone in this room that will come in their future be strong. We ask you to guide us as we lead on you. We hope that you can help us take the words of, all these words of encouragement that came from you today and, and put them into practice today, tomorrow, and forever. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.